Welcome, everyone. Today, we are going to dive into some of the prophets. Let's open in prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. I'm going to pray the Come Holy Spirit prayer. Come Holy Spirit and fill the hearts of your faithful. Enkindle in us the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit, and we shall be created, and you shall renew the face of the earth. O God, who by the light of the Holy Spirit did instruct the hearts of the faithful, grant that by the same spirit we may be truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolations. Amen. 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 In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Tonight we're going to go through most of the time period of the divided kingdom. So, let's review a bit. After the death of Solomon in the year 930 BC, the kingdom of Israel split in two. This is our map for the week, so if you still have it, great. If you don't, it's not that complicated. Israel in the north, capital is Samaria. Judah in the south, capital is Jerusalem. That's what this part of the world looks like right now. So, the southern kingdom, called Judah, was ruled by Rehoboam, Solomon's stiff-necked, foolish son. Judah had only two of the twelve tribes, the tribe of Judah and the tribe of Benjamin. But it had the real capital, Jerusalem. It had the real temple, Solomon's temple. And it had the real kings, the sons of David. The northern kingdom is the part that's still called Israel. And it had most of the people, ten tribes. It was ruled by Jeroboam, one of Solomon's ambitious administrators. God sent the prophet Ahijah to tell Jeroboam, take the northern kingdom, I'm giving it to you. I give you, Ahijah tore his cloak in 12 pieces, remember he gave uh, Jeroboam 10 pieces and said, take this, take 10 pieces, rule the northern kingdom faithfully and I will bless you. Instead, we get golden calves. Jeroboam set up two golden calves to worship, one in the south in Bethel and one in Dan in the north. Here's Dan in the north, major tourist site today. Every king in the northern kingdom was an idol worshiper, and virtually all the people fell into idolatry. The religious situation in the south wasn't much better. So, let's take a look at our king's handout and get a handle on this week. The first thing you'll probably notice, well, let's see, you got the kings of Judah, there's the lion of the tribe of Judah. And you got the kings of Israel under the bull for Baal worship. So, you'll notice the kings who are the sons of David, there's an unbroken dynasty. This is, of course, important because the dynasty endures all the way to Jesus, son of David. On the other side, though, you've got, I think it's eight different dynasties or nine different dynasties in just, oh... 250 years. Every time you see a sideways arrow, there's a coup or a civil war or something of that nature going on. Um, another fun part you'll notice is when the two dynasties combine. Uh, evil Ahab and Jezebel, their evil daughter Athaliah, marries into David's house and attempts to kill all of the line of David. She misses one kid. This kid is hidden away for six years and finally brought out and crowned king. Until then, Athaliah rules Judah as evil queen until Joash is brought forth. And so the line of David is almost extinguished, but it survives. Let's add some dates. It's always easy to remember when David was king. He ruled in the year 1000. Year 1000 is when he conquers Jerusalem and brings in the Ark of the Covenant. You can see written in tiny little gray letters on here some of these dates, but Solomon dies in 930. That's when the kingdom splits, 930 BC. Then note down below, the very end of the kingdom of Israel, the northern kingdom, 721 BC. That's when the Assyrians invade, conquer Samaria, and take out the northern kingdom. Then, look at the very bottom under Zedekiah, end of the line of the Purple Kings, 587 BC. It's when the Babylonians invade, take out the southern kingdom, take them into exile. 
this is the main time of the prophets. God sends one prophet after another to both these kingdoms to call the people back to him. So let's add in a few prophets right now. Elijah, put him next to Ahab and Jezebel. That is when he is hard at work. They kept him busy. Add in Elisha right underneath him. All right, go down several generations to Jeroboam II under those kings of Israel. Right next to him, right, Jonah. That's when Jonah lived. All right, now go over to the purple kings and look pretty far down. You'll see Hezekiah. See Hezekiah? He's one of the good kings. Write Isaiah's name next to him. Go down three more kings. You'll see... uh, Actually, you'll see Josiah. Go down to the very end of the Purple Kings and write Jeremiah. We'll get to him next week. Okay. So there are some of your important prophets and where they fit in. Elijah and Elisha are remembered for their miracles. They didn't write books of their own. They performed incredible signs and wonders for God. Isaiah and Jeremiah are remembered not so much for their outrageous miracles, so they've got a few, but for their oracles from the Lord, which they wrote down in these beautiful poetic books. All right, let's dive into the story. Last week we talked about Elijah. He's remembered as Israel's greatest prophet. God sent him to be a divine pain in the rear to Ahab and Jezebel the evil Baal-worshipping power couple. Elijah prayed that it did not reign in Israel for three and a half years. Oh, there he is. God sent ravens to feed him, and then a Phoenician woman to take care of him during the famine. He raised her son from the dead. Then, on Mount Carmel, Elijah had a grand showdown with the prophets of Baal in front of all Israel. He called down fire from heaven and proved to the people, Yahweh is God. Thunder, lightning, pouring rain, the famine is over. But Jezebel threatened his life. She said, you're a dead man, and Elijah lost heart. He became horribly depressed, ran into the desert, and went looking for God at Mount Sinai. There at Mount Sinai, Elijah heard the Lord speak to him, in the still small voice. He called a successor, Elisha, rained down fire from heaven a few more times, and even got Ahab to repent a little. Then he was taken up to heaven in a chariot of fire. This is all in the second half of 1 Kings, the chariot of fire is at the beginning of 2 Kings. When Elijah was about to be taken up to heaven, Elisha asked for a gift for a double share of his spirit. Now, last week you talked about how in in inheritance law, this meant, you know, treat me as your firstborn. Give me me double the inheritance of of all the other sons. But uh, the biblical author took it quite literally because a lot of commentators see Elijah gets eight miracles in the Bible and Elisha gets 16. (laughs) So, double share indeed. The early part of 2 Kings is all of Elisha's miracles, just one right after the next. It's it's great reading, actually. So if you're looking for some good Bible reading that you haven't done before, uh, try the beginning part of 2 Kings. Uh, Go a chapter in, you get the tales of Elisha. Uh, He deserves to be better known, and that part of the Bible deserves to be better read. Okay, reading about Elisha you immediately get the impression that he's a kinder, gentler version of Elijah. Elijah is the prophet who shows God's power, right? The one who brings famine and rain, the one who has a showdown with the thousand pagan prophets, the one who calls down fire from heaven. Again, the whole reason is to shock a highly rebellious people into realizing that God is God. But you'll recall in the Gospels when James and John asked Jesus, can we call down fire from heaven on the Samaritans already? Jesus rebukes them. Jesus is slow to anger, quick to bless. And we see that in Elisha. Most of Elisha's miracles are miracles of blessing. 
Elijah is the forerunner of John the Baptist, calling the people to repentance, right? Elisha appears as a forerunner of Jesus. You can start with their names. Both Elisha and Jesus, their name means the same thing. They both mean God saves. You'll see more parallels between Elisha and Jesus as the story continues. After Elijah goes up to heaven in his chariot of fire, Elisha picks up Elijah's cloak. I just imagine him standing there going, okay, now what? (laughs) Picks up the cloak, puts it on, walks over to the Jordan River, goes, what do I do now? He rolls up the cloak, hits the river, and goes, where is the Lord God of Israel? And the waters part for him. It's a marvelous image of stepping out in faith. Elisha doesn't know what just happened or what God's got in store for him now, but it's his time to step up, and he does. When God calls us to step up, when it's our time to step up, we also get to say, yes, Lord. This is the, sea, this is the spot on the Jordan River where Elijah was taken up to heaven. It's right near Jericho. This is the same spot where John the Baptist baptized Jesus. So both Elisha and Jesus begin their ministries right here. Christians today come to be baptized on the same spot. Or I imagine most of these Christians are renewing their baptisms, but that's good too. I'll I'll do that the next time I get to Israel and there isn't a war. So Elisha walks back over from the Jordan side to the Israel side of the river, where a large group of disciples are watching and cheering him on. They think this parting of the river is awesome. They say, the spirit of Elijah rests on Elisha. They bow to him. But they can't believe that Elijah is really gone. You know, maybe he's, maybe he's just gone for a joyride in the heavenly chariot, and he'll be back soon. So they insist, we've got search parties. We've got to go find him. Elisha tells them this is pointless, but they don't listen to him. They take off. Like John the Baptist and Jesus, Elijah and Elisha are followed by a large group of disciples who are often pretty clueless. <laughs> Second Kings calls them the sons of the prophets. They're prophets in training. Elisha goes walking to Jericho while his disciples are combing the desert looking for any sign of Elijah. Jericho today is a nice quiet place, oasis in the desert. I don't know what they grew there 2,000 years ago, but today they grow banana palms. The elders in Jericho come to Elisha and say, we have a problem. Look at our beautiful oasis. Look at all the crops we grow, but our water is bitter. Now it's making us sick and our crops are dying. Elijah says, hand me a bowl of salt. So they give him the bowl of salt. He sprinkles salt in their spring and the water becomes healthy. Here is the Elisha spring in Jericho. This is the spring in Jericho. This is the water he purified. There's not too many Elisha memorials in the Holy Land, but this is definitely one of them. Here it says Jericho, the oldest city in the world. It's very low elevation, right near the Dead Sea, very hot there. And here you've got the Elisha Spring Fountain. Uh, Jericho really is one of the oldest cities in the world. It's been around since about 10,000 B.C. Ties with a few other cities for the honor. Uh, Jericho is on the West Bank, but it's generally a peaceful place, and Christian tours often come there. What are some of Elisha's other miracle stories? We're going to go through them all, because the more I read the stories, the more I remembered how really awesome Elisha is. So, first off, hill country of Ephraim, where he and his disciples were uh, spending time, Elisha multiplied food. A man brought Elisha 20 small loaves of barley bread. Elisha multiplied the loaves, fed his 100 disciples with it, and told them, the Lord says, eat, and there will be plenty left over. And indeed, there was. Does this sound familiar to anyone? Mm -hmm. I think so. Yeah, I think so, yeah. Uh, Except Jesus does a better job, right? He only takes five loaves of barley bread, you know, one boy's lunch, and two fish, feeds 5,000 people with plenty left over. You see this, actually. It's pretty funny. 
Elisha takes Elijah's miracles and intensifies them, makes them even better. And then Jesus takes Elisha's miracles and one-ups him. (laughs) Another time, Elisha and his prophets were in Gilgal across the Jordan River, and there was a famine in the land. Looks pretty dry to me. They tried to gather some herbs to make stew, but one disciple accidentally put a poisonous plant in the stew. Elisha threw a handful of grain in the pot, and that purified it, so now they could all eat. Another time, Elisha and his disciples were building shelters. They'd they'd outgrown their former home, and they went, we need to start our own village. So they're out across the Jordan River building shelters. One bumbling disciple drops his axe head into the Jordan River, falls off his axe while he's chopping wood. The man's horrified. He says, you need to help me, Elisha. I borrowed this from a friend. He'll never forgive me. You know, iron axe heads were a big deal back then. You're not just going to go out and you find them in the, the nearest corner store. So Elisha threw a stick in the water and up floated the axe head to the surface. This, again, it's like Jesus. Jesus had power over the elements. Jesus commanded Peter to walk on water, and Peter did. Mm -hmm. So Elisha commanded an axe head to walk on water. Not quite the same thing, but we're getting there. This is a very blurry picture of Shunem. Elisha frequently stayed in the town of Shunem. Today it's an Arab-Israeli town in Galilee. There was a pious, wealthy woman who set up a room for him and hosted him. And there's a plaque on this wall saying, this is the home of the pious, wealthy woman who used to host Elisha. (laughs) This mother, well, sorry, not a mother yet. I skipped ahead. Uh, Yeah, the plaque says basically in Hebrew, in the year 826 BC, Elisha was here. He slept in this house. One day, Elisha asked the woman, you know, you've been so hospitable to me. What can I do for you? And she said, I don't need anything. But Elisha's servant suggested, she is old and she has no children. So Elisha told her, in nine months you will conceive. And she and her husband had a son. When the child was older, he suddenly had a horrible pain in his head and died. His mother, of course, was distraught. Wasn't this her miracle baby? She rode a donkey to Mount Carmel and tracked down Elisha. There's that cave of Elijah. Maybe Elisha was hanging out there. Elisha sent his wooden staff with his servant, who lay the staff in the boy's face, and then nothing happened. So the servant rode back to Mount Carmel and reported to Elisha, uh, I did what you said. I put the staff on the dead boy. Yeah, nothing happened. It didn't work. So... Elisha himself comes, and he sees the boy's cold, very dead body. He shuts the door and he prays. He puts his hands on the boy's hand, says, presses his face to the boy's face, uh, puts his mouth on his mouth, breathes into him. His body starts to become warm. Elisha gets up, he paces, he prays some more, he stretches himself out on the boy one more time, and the boy sneezes seven times and opens his eyes. With all the going back and forth, he must have been at least a day or two dead. But Elisha had faith that nothing was impossible with God. Amen. Again, you don't see anything like this again until Jesus comes along. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's like the raising of Lazarus from the dead. Yet yeah, even the delay in time before he showed up, exactly. So it's a lesson for us to persevere in prayer and trust God. Because if he answers the prayers of a mere human being like that, you know, he wants to answer ours too. Okay, there is one baffling, disturbing Elisha story. I thought about skipping it, but that wouldn't be fair. I think of this as his Elijah moment. It's the story of the she-bears. Right after Elijah was taken up to heaven, and Elisha went on to Jericho and made the bitter water sweet, Elisha then walked up to Bethel. Here's the story. Straight from the Bible. While he was going up on the way, some small boys came out of the city and jeered at him, saying, Go up, you bald head. Go up, you bald head. 
And he turned around, and when he saw them, he cursed them in the name of the Lord. And two she-bears came out of the woods and mauled 42 of the boys. The end. <laughs> Elijah calls down the wrath of God on some innocent children because they insulted his lack of hair. Touchy, touchy. <laughs> okay, so what's really going on? First off, I gotta say, I think of this story with fondness because many years ago now, a friend of mine going through RCIA to get confirmed, she asked God, you know, God, open up the scriptures to me. You know, let your words speak to me. And she opens up the Bible, and she opens right up the story of the she-bears. <laughs> and she goes, God? <laughs> anyway, funny enough, that got her really studying the Bible because she had to know what this story with the she-bears was all about. And so she, she found commentary, she started studying, she read other stories of Elijah and Elisha, and then she went on to read the rest of the Bible from there. Anyway, that's just one way how God works in mysterious ways. <laughs> God can use even the most unlikely stories to draw people to himself. But what does the story actually mean? What's going on? So Elisha's going up to Bethel. Where's the golden calf? Two places. Bethel and Dan. Bethel and Dan, yeah. So he's going to the city that's got the golden calf sanctuary. Now, the Bible translates the, te the, the, the original text as small boys, Yet yeah, probably not so much. It translates equally well as young men. Okay. So don't picture cute little kids. Mm -hmm. Picture strapping young men confronting Elijah. Elisha. I'm going to be doing that the whole class. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. At the very least, these men are golden calf worshipers. Uh, it's entirely possible that they're part of the system, that they work for the temple. So, when they say, go up, you bald head, what does go up mean? It means go up to the high place, go up to the temple. Mm -hmm. And bald head. Okay, maybe it's just a silly insult. But it could also be comparing him with Elijah. Elijah famously wore all the animal skins, right? He's a hairy guy. And they're saying to him, bald head, you're no Elijah. You know, you think you're Elijah. Mm -hmm. God's not with you. So there's a fuller picture. Now you've got young men in front of the temple of the golden calf. Big group of young men. It's at least 42, probably more. They're threatening Elisha. They're saying, go worship the pagan gods at our temple. So he's confronted with... Uh, with this mob, and then he calls down the she-bears. Mm -hmm. He asks God for help, and God gives him help. Where's God in the story? God is our mama bear. Mm -hmm. He's our protector. We are his children. Just like a mama bear, oh, if her cubs are threatened, she's gonna protect them. God's giving us this picture, you're my children. When you're threatened, I am going to protect you. I'm going to protect you in the same way. This is one of those areas in the Old Testament where it makes sense to hear that the Lord God is a jealous God. He's jealous for us. He wants to protect us. And you see that here, how he protects Elisha at the very beginning of his career as a prophet. All right, here's another odd story of God's protection. The kings of Israel, Judah, and Edom went to war together against Moab. Yeah, not that Moab. <laughs> this Moab. Um, this was the capital city of ancient Moab. It's called Karak. It's in modern-day Jordan. Today, it's most famous for the massive ruins of its crusader castle. Tourists go there to explore the ruins. Uh, that's the kitchen inside the castle. Slight digression, I'm sorry, but when I was in Israel, I got to go explore a different crusader castle. This is Nimrod Fortress. Uh, this is actually a Muslim castle they built to, pr to protect against the crusaders. It's at the foothills of Mount Hermon, way up on the Golden Heights. And 
it's really fun to explore these places. You find all these hidden rooms. You go underground. You walk the ramparts. I walked all the way up this hill to take this picture. It was quite a climb. Wow. Also, you took all these pictures yourself? Uh, not all of them, no. But this one I did, and I'm proud of the effort. Yeah. <laughs> all right. So, back to Moab. The three kings of Israel, Judah, and Edom are invading Moab. But to get there, you have to cross this. Ugh. They look for water in the desert for seven days, and they can't find any. Now, the king of Judah at the time is Jehoshaphat. He does not jump. <laughs> he is not a bad guy. Most of the kings of Judah are evil men. He has a mixed record. He really shouldn't be out there fighting alongside the uh, evil pagan king of Israel in the first place. But when he's out there, he gets stuck. He decides to turn to God. He gets a brainwave. Maybe we should inquire of a prophet of the Lord. And a servant says, you mean like Elisha? Yeah, like Elisha. And the king of Israel goes, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> Not Elisha. I don't talk to Elisha. Jehoshaphat goes, well, I want to talk to Elisha. Call him in. So Elisha is summoned. He walks straight past Jehoshaphat, walks up to the king of Israel and says, what have I to do with you? Go talk to your father and mother's prophets. Uh, he's the son of Ahab and Jezebel. Mm -hmm. But the king of Israel says, look, we really want God's help. You just see the confused look on Elisha's face. And he says, well, for the sake of Jehoshaphat over there, who isn't a half bad guy, I'll help you. Bring me a minstrel. You don't often get to see how the different prophets hear from God. Sometimes you get clues in the different books. Mm -hmm. Some of the prophets go out in the desert, fast, pray, have their visions. Some of the prophets prophesy with a pen in hand. God, what are you saying to me? Mm -hmm. And th those are more of the, the later prophets. But then some of the prophets, especially the earlier prophets, they're charismatics. You play the music and they hear from God. So, they bring in someone to play the harp. And Elisha gets into the, the, the harp music and listens to God. He says to the kings, oh, God is with you. This, this invasion will be successful and he'll provide you with water. Pools will spring up in the desert. There will be no rain. They will come out of absolutely nowhere. God is providing for you. Uh, you. You see this quoted poetically in Psalm 107. The Lord turns a desert into pools of water, a parched land into springs of water. And sure enough, when the armies wake up the next morning, they see all the little pits in the desert. Oh, there's, a, there's Elisha listening to the harpist. I got carried away and forgot to do slides. Mm -hmm. When they wake up the next morning in the desert, all the low places are filled with pools of water. When the Moabites, the people they're attacking, wake up, they see the sun rising over the pools, bright red sun, and the glare off the water makes them think, that's blood. Huh, the people of Israel and Judah must have finally killed each other. <laughs> they go, let's attack them right now. We're bound to win. They've already decimated each other. Mm -hmm. So the Moabites leave their fortress, run out, and then see, oh. <laughs> There's 10,000 of them. There's 10,000 of them, exactly. So the three kings with their armies defeat the Moabites. And what God said was true. They win. Mm -hmm. This is a story about God providing. Also how it's never too late to turn back to him. Mm -hmm. Even if you're the king of Israel, one of the bad guys, Never too late to turn back to him, even if you're Jehoshaphat in this morally ambiguous situation. God still wants to help you. God still wants to meet you where you're at. He knows we're not perfect. He stands ready to forgive us, help us, be with us, help us to move on from wherever we are. 
Now we come to the most famous Elisha story. Elisha cures the Syrian general Naaman of leprosy. Here's Syria. This is a Roman temple in Damascus. Damascus being the capital of Syria both today and back in the time of Elisha. So Naaman, Naaman is high up in the Syrian government. He's a general, but he's got leprosy. So the king of Syria writes to the king of Israel, who is uh, here in Samaria, nothing left of Samaria but some ruins. He says, I'm sending you, you know, one of my best generals, you know, give him all hospitality and heal him. <laughs> the king of Israel receives this letter and goes, this is some kind of trick. He's looking for an excuse to declare war on me. I can't heal anyone of leprosy. Nobody can heal anyone of leprosy. Then one of the servants goes, uh, I think he meant Elisha. Oh, him. <laughs> so here's the actual ruins of Ahab's palace. The king sends or, or sends a messenger to Elisha going, Naaman the Syrian wants to talk to you. So Naaman the Syrian shows up. And Elisha sends out a servant to meet him. And the servant says, wash seven times in the Jordan River and you'll be clean. Naaman is furious. He goes away in a rage. Why? Because Elisha, Elisha didn't come himself. Naaman goes, I'm important. You sent out a servant to give me a message. You couldn't be bothered to come yourself. And, and you tell me, oh, go, go wash in the Jordan. What? Syria doesn't have better rivers, we do. Naaman is fed up. He, he, he goes, you know, this is ridiculous, I'm going home. But then the servants around him say, if he had told you to do some tremendous feat of strength, do something very difficult, you would have done that. Go wash in the river. So Naaman washes in the Jordan just like people today come to wash in the Jordan. Of course, this is a foreshadowing of baptism, which heals us, which heals us from our sins. And just like that, Naaman was healed. He comes up out of the water. He's astonished. He goes back to Elisha and professes faith in one God, the God of Israel. He says, I'll never worship another God again. Your God is the one true God. Full conversion. In fact, he says, so that I can worship your God better, I'm going to need to take some soil back with me because the, the belief at the time was that the God is the God of, a, of the land. You know, each land has its own God. He's like, well, I need to worship the God of Israel, so let's start filling buckets. <laughs> He's going to take Israel's soil back to Damascus and build an altar to the God of Israel on Israel's soil. <laughs> so, there's a lot going on here. First off, baptism, right? Second, again, this is another story that foreshadows Jesus. Jesus cured lepers, and he cured them in much the same way. He said, go. He didn't, he didn't cure them on the spot. He said, go to the temple and have the priest examine you. And it was a test of faith. Would they say, what do you mean? You know, I've still got leprosy. I, I can't go to the temple. You know, they'll kick me out. But as they walk on the way, they're healed. It's a lot like what happened with Naaman. It's, it's a leap of faith. Also, remember the leper that came back to thank Jesus? Naaman's like that leper. He comes back to thank Elisha and to declare allegiance to the God of Israel. Jesus gives a commentary on this story to the synagogue of Nazareth. It's the one that makes the people in Nazareth so furious with him they try to throw him off a cliff. But he says... You know, a prophet is never welcome in his hometown. You know, Elijah and Elisha, they weren't welcome in Samaria. Mm -hmm. There were many widows in Israel at the time of the famine. But did Elisha, or did Elijah help any of them? No, no. He went to Phoenicia. He went to Sidon. He helped the Phoenician widow. Mm -hmm. And there were many barren women in the time of Elisha in Israel. But did God send him to help any of them? No, no. He helped a foreign lady. <laughs> Again. So 
And there were many lepers in Israel in the time of Elisha. But did God send Elisha to heal any of them? No, no. He sent Naaman the Syrian, an enemy general. So Jesus makes the point. God didn't just come for you. He didn't just come for you faithful who are seated here in the synagogue or for us faithful who are seated here in this church. He came to save the world. So, just like the Jews of Jesus' time, we as Christians, we're called not to, you know, to pat ourselves on the back at how holy we are. We're called to reach out to others. We're called to remember that Jesus loves them too. Jesus loves everyone. We get to be Jesus, share the love of Jesus with the people who don't know him. Amen? Amen. All right. Finally, another great lesson from Naaman, the importance of humility. Naaman would never have gotten healed if he hadn't finally chosen to humble himself and just do what God's prophet asked him to do. How often do we need to just humble ourselves, just just eat crow, and just go do the right thing? Whether that means biting our tongue at work, you know, turning the other cheek when someone's being snippy with us, just doing the job we don't want to do, but we know it's the right thing to do. This is the kind of stuff that happens every day. We get to be humble and obey. Amen? Amen. All right. Any thoughts or questions so far on Elisha? Okay. Are these stories new to anyone? Yes. Maybe not name the Syrian, but I bet some of the others are, right? Yeah. All right. Here we go. Here is a story that really should be better known. This is a story of how Elisha thwarts the Syrian attacks. You know, after he heals the general, he's now going to take care of the rest of the army. All right. The king of Syria is at war with Israel. Here's some more ancient ruins near Damascus. But the king of Syria has a problem. He makes all these great war plans that really should work, and every time he sends in his army, the army of Israel ambushes them and is able to defeat the Syrian army. And he goes, I've got a spy. That's the only way that this could keep happening. And he starts to interrogate all of his, uh, his close companions, his generals, and finally one of them says, look, the only spy is that prophet in Samaria, Elisha. He knows everything you say in the quiet of your bedroom. <laughs> the king of Syria decides to send the entire Syrian army after Elisha. He says, this man must be stopped. So, Elisha is in the town of Dothan, city of Dothan. It's got walls. And this is near Samaria. The Syrian army comes and surrounds the city. Elisha and his servant are looking out at the Syrian army over the walls, and the servant goes, what do we do? You know, we, we can't defend ourselves against an army like this. And Elisha turns to him and says, don't be afraid. Those who are with us are more than those who are against us. The servant says, what do you mean? And Elisha prays, Lord, open his eyes. And when he prayed, the eyes of his servant were opened, and they both saw the heavenly armies, the chariots of fire, the angels coming out of heaven and surrounding them with their protection, surrounding the Syrians on all sides. So often we hear about the heavenly host. In Mass, we hear about, you know, Lord God of hosts, right? I think sometimes that word flies right over people's heads. You know, you hear host and you think, Oh, someone's hosting us. You know, they'll, they'll give us a nice dinner and a place to sleep. No, no. The heavenly host in the Bible is the heavenly armies. It's these guys. It's the angel armies with fiery chariots. So every time you hear the word host at mass or in scripture in this context, this is what they mean. So they look out at the heavenly armies and Elisha asks them, for a, for a favor, he says, strike the Syrians with blindness. And they do. 
the Syrian army, the entire Syrian army is suddenly struck blind. They don't know what to do. Completely bemused, Elisha comes down from the walls, walks out of the gates and says, are you looking for the prophet Elisha? Yeah, yeah, we are. Oh, well, he's not here. He actually went, he, he, he actually went to the next city over. Come on, I'll show you. Oh, thanks, thanks. So they all, you know, put a hand on each other's shoulders, put a hand on Elisha, and Elisha walks them right into the walls of Samaria, <laughs> right into the palace of the, the courtyard of the king of Israel, and he shuts the doors, all the archers come out on the walls, and then Elisha says, Lord, can you give them their sight back? And then the Syrian army sees where they are. They're trapped. Mm -hmm. They're prisoners of war. Mm -hmm. The king of Israel is blown away. He's looking out at the entire Syrian army, which he just captured, mm -hmm. and he says to Elisha, can I kill him? <laughs> and Elisha says, no, they're prisoners of war. Treat them with respect. How about we throw them a party? Wow. <laughs> so... The king of Israel brings out the wine, the meat, and he feasts the Syrian army, which is very, very confused at this point. And then he lets them go. They trudge back home to Syria, and they never invade Israel again in that generation. <laughs> so it worked. It worked. Nobody died, and it worked. There's Samaria. So, what's going on here? Well, like Jesus, Elisha sometimes had the gift to know what other people were thinking. We see Jesus, you know, hearing other people's thoughts, especially in the book of John, but here, Elisha does the same thing. He, he knows what the Syrians are planning hundreds of miles away. Jesus gave sight to the blind. He gave physical sight to the blind man. He gave spiritual sight to his disciples. Like Jesus, Elisha shows God's power over physical and spiritual sight. We get to pray for spiritual sight, right? We want to see God in every situation in our lives. We want to know, God, what are you doing? How are you in this situation? We get to trust that God is with us in every situation, but sometimes we get confused about, well, what do I do now? And that's when we need spiritual sight. We can pray, God, show me the way forward. Everybody thought Elisha was dead that he was surrounded by the entire Syrian army, but God showed him his way forward. Yet another story where God is our protector. All right, we're doing okay. We're getting toward the end of the Elisha stories, but now we have two stories that ask the question, how much do we want God's blessing? One of Elisha's disciples passes, and his wife comes to Elisha and says, I can't pay our debts. Our creditor wants to take my two young boys into slavery. Please help me. And Elisha says, gather as many pots as you can. She doesn't say, why? What good is this going to do? She goes, yes. She asks her neighbors, can you loan me all your pots? I need every pot in this town. And she fills her kitchen with giant empty jugs. Then, Elisha comes and starts filling the jugs with oil. And the jug that he uses to pour the oil in, it never runs dry. He fills every jug in her kitchen with oil and then says, sell the oil, your debts are paid. Wow. All right, another story. How much do we want God's blessing? Oh, she, look at it this way. She wanted God's blessing. She obeyed enthusiastically. She went and gathered all the pots from her neighbors, even when she had no idea what this was for or what good this might do. And God blessed her tremendously. But then we see something similar happen with Elisha and King Joash, king of Israel. God wants to give King Joash a blessing. So Elisha says to Joash, you know, take an arrow and shoot it out the window. All right, he does. That is going to be what God does to Syria. You're going to have great victory over Syria. Now, take this bundle of arrows and strike the ground. And Joash goes, huh? You mean like this? Tap, tap, tap. And Elisha goes, 
All right, you'll have three tepid victories over Syria, and then you'll start losing again. You could have been a little more enthusiastic about it. The Bible says that if we're faithful to God in the small things, that he's going to bless us in the big things. We start with small responsibilities. He gives us great responsibilities. How do we do in the small responsibilities? Do we follow God with enthusiasm? We need the enthusiasm of the widow who gathered all the oil jugs, not the, uh, the mediocrity of the king who went tap, tap, tap. We're called to follow God with enthusiasm so we can receive all the blessings God wants to give us. He's waiting for us to go out there and get them. All right. Finally. Oh, there's the archer. Oh, that's the king shooting the air out the window. And our instruction, strike the ground with everything you've got. Elisha dies, and he's buried, but that doesn't make much difference as far as God working through him because there's a funeral going on. There's a procession going on past Elisha's grave, and then suddenly there's a Moabite raid. The people toss the body into Elisha's grave and run off for cover, and as soon as the dead man's body comes into contact with the bones of Elisha, he springs back to life. There he goes. So first off, you got Elisha with the double portion, right? Elijah raised one man from the dead, but Elisha gets to raise two people from the dead. Also, we see Elisha's grave as a place of resurrection. This foreshadows, of course, Jesus' grave as the ultimate place of resurrection. And finally, we get an example in the Bible of relics. God likes to work through relics. It is a good thing to visit the tombs of saints or to pray in front of relics. It can be a place where God meets us in faith and blesses us as he chooses. You may ask, where are the relics of Elisha? Well, tradition has it he was buried just outside Samaria in this tomb. Christian tradition has it uh, from the early 300s that this is where he was buried, him and John the Baptist both. Now that sounds strange because John the Baptist was killed all the way on the other side of the Jordan. So maybe we look at this with a skeptical eye, but the early Christians said, this is where Elisha and John the Baptist are buried. <clears throat> the bones are brought to Alexandria in the 5th century for protection. And then, again for protection, they're brought to this monastery, the Monastery of St. Macarius in Egypt in the 10th century. In 1976, the main church was being restored, and when they dug under the altar, they uncovered about 10 skeletons. One was missing a head. It's thought that the bones of Elisha and John the Baptist, just as well as the bones of uh, the desert father, St. Macarius, just might be mixed up with that group of saintly skeletons. They're all stuffed under this altar. This is the only picture of it I could find online. And I'm going to briefly tell one of my relic stories. A lot of you have heard my story about the relics of St. Dominic that God first used to, to call me and wake me up. But I've got another relic story. About a little more than 10 years ago, I was praying in front of the relics of St. Ambrose. Now, St. Ambrose is the patron saint of vocations, among other things. You know, he, uh, he's the one that called St. Augustine, right? He calls people to, to go and serve God. One day I'm praying in front of his relics and I hear, you have a vocation. The voice was so clear. Squinted and I went, what, me? <laughs> uh, usually when people say they have a vocation, they need priests or deacons or uh, perhaps marriage. I'm already married. What are you talking about? Later, I was holding Matthew Kelly's Rediscover Catholicism book in my lap. I was praying the rosary, and I was using the book to remind myself what the mysteries were. I was still a new Catholic at the time. And I was overwhelmed with, like, oh, I've got three young kids. I can't keep the house clean. I'm praying, you know, God, help me be a decent mother. Help me get the house clean. Uh, just help keep me sane. <laughs> and I'm trying to pray that. And instead, I hear Ambrose telling me, I want you to preach and be bold. Like, what? I keep praying the rosary. I keep hearing Ambrose say, I want you to preach and be bold. And, and, and finally, I put 
put the rosary on, I put the book down, and I go, preach what? <laughs> and I look down at the book, and there's a bookmark in the book that I hadn't noticed before, and I take it out, and it's got one word on it, teach. <laughs> and I said, teach what? I have to dump the book again. Hold up the book. Teach this? Matthew Kelly's Rediscover Catholicism? The next day I get a phone call from Deacon Ty Tran, and he says, Kristen, I'm going to be teaching Matthew Kelly's Rediscover Catholicism. You ever heard of this book? I'd like you to teach it with me. Wow. And I said, great. He said, well, really, you should pray about this first. And I said, I already have. <laughs> and that is the first Bible study I ever taught. And I've been teaching Bible studies ever since. And you do a wonderful job. Thank you. So, relics. Don't underestimate them. <laughs> So, let's take 10 minutes here for some discussion questions. Mm -hmm. I got two of them. How much in your life do you want God's blessing? Where do you get to obey God enthusiastically, like the woman with the jars? Where can you obey God enthusiastically? And God continually guided Elisha in prayer. Elisha's always turning to God for guidance. Is there a time God guided you in prayer? We're all priests, prophets, and kings by virtue of our baptism, right? Mm -hmm. So we get to be prophets. God gets to guide us. Think about it. Where has he guided you in the past in prayer? All right, let's bring it back. So, random trivia before we move on. This mosaic of St. Ambrose, who died in 397 AD, this is in his cathedral in Milan, and it actually is what he looks like. It was done during his lifetime. He's one of the very few ancient saints that we have a portrait of. Okay. So, because yeah, he doesn't look like your generic white bearded man in the long robe. He looks like a kind of young, skinny guy. <laughs> he, he, he looks like a real person. So, St. Ambrose. Moving on. Okay, uh, we're going to have to cover all these things pretty quickly, but okay. that's what I planned on. Otherwise, we'll never get through the Old Testament. <laughs> and I want to get to Jesus one of these weeks. <laughs> all right. So, we got the story of Jonah, who came from Gath Hepper, the book of 2 Kings tells us. It's currently the Arab-Israeli city of Mashhad in Galilee. Jonah lived in the northern kingdom at the time of Jeroboam II. And God said, go to Nineveh and tell the people to turn from their evil ways. This is Nineveh. It still stands. The walls, the towers, huge parts of it are still standing. Do you know where it is? It's in Iraq. It's the modern, it's in northern Iraq. It's the modern day city of Mosul which we heard plenty about during the Iraq war, remember? That's Nineveh. I didn't know that at the time. And if you go just outside the city of Mosul, you'll find the ruins of these ancient palaces, the kings of Assyria. So again, capital of Assyria in the ancient world, which is different from Syria, just to be confusing. Syria, Damascus, Assyria, Nineveh. More photos of a uh, modern day Nineveh. That's one of the gates. I can tell they've done a lot of restoration, but still, you get the idea of what it did look like back in the day. There's some UN observers in Iraq standing next to the gates of Nineveh. Oh, and there's modern-day Mosul. So, Jonah did not want to go to Nineveh. He did not like the Assyrians. He did not want to help them or bring God's word to them one bit. So he went to Joppa. You know where Joppa is? It's Tel Aviv! <laughs> yeah! Uh-huh, Joppa is Tel Aviv. It only comes up a few times in the Bible. Uh, Solomon had his port there. That's where he imported the cedars. It's where Jonah sails to Nineveh. It's Tel Aviv. 
I know, fun trivia, huh? So, um, there's the lovely coast. I, it was our first place we landed in Israel, like everyone else. And it just feels, it, it feels quite a bit like San Diego. It's just the bougainvillea, the palm trees, the beaches. Um, blurry photo, but Tel Aviv, the white city. It's got all the 1930s architecture. And there's, an, there's a, the old city, Tel Aviv, is still called Jaffa. So when we first landed in Israel, we stayed in an Airbnb in Jaffa. That was on our door. There we are at the main square of, of old Jaffa, me and my mom and my aunt. So, oh, main Christian site in, uh, in Tel Aviv, in Jaffa, is the house of Simon the Tanner. We'll get there when we get to the New Testament. But uh, that's where Peter stayed. This is the port where Jonah sailed to Nineveh. It's the oldest port in Israel. I hear it's the oldest continuously active port in the world. It's been in use for 3,000 years. And uh, today, though, all the big ships go to Haifa, so it's not much in use. Right now, it's just a great place to sit on a hot day, have a drink, watch the water. <laughs> so, Jonah went down to Joppa, boarded a ship for Tarshish. Where's Tarshish? It's Spain. Here's the Straits of Gibraltar. Tarshish to the ancients was the ends of the earth. Spain. Okay. So sometimes you hear about ships of Tarshish. That means they're strong enough to make it all the way across the Mediterranean. Mm -hmm. It's a big ship. But when Jonah boards the ship, things go wrong. There's a storm. The sailors cast lots. They find out, oh, there's some god that seems to be angry with you, Jonah. And he says, yeah, I'm kind of running from the lord of all creation. You should throw me overboard to save all of your lives. So they do just that. Jonah is cast into the sea and is swallowed by a giant fish, of which there are many fun representations in art. He's in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights, just like Jesus in his tomb. And then the fish spits him back up right where he started. You know, we try to do our own thing, and then we find out we haven't actually made any headway at all in life. <laughs> and really, God, we're God wants. And really, we should just do what, what God wants us to do. Yeah. He's got the plans. He knows what he's doing. So Jonah walks to Nineveh. Hi, Nineveh. He, it's a three-day walk through the city. He walks through and says, Nineveh will be overthrown. People speculate that after three days in the fish, he wasn't looking too great. Bleached skin, no hair, you know, looked like a man come back from the dead. They go, I don't know what he's been through, but I don't want to go through that. All right. The people of Nineveh repent in sackcloth and ashes. They even throw sackcloth and ashes on their animals. Imagining cows going through the city covered in sackcloth and ashes. And God forgave them. Jonah did not. Jonah prayed to God. In anger, he said, I knew you were a merciful God, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. <laughs> That's why I didn't want this job. <laughs> he said, Nineveh is our enemy. I want them to be destroyed. He even says to God, take my life. It's better for me to die than to live. God speaks to him. What right have you to be angry? Jonah's a forgiven sinner. Mm -hmm. We're all forgiven sinners. People of Nineveh were, Nineveh were forgiven sinners. I like how God says to Jonah, what right have you to be angry? And it's something we get to take to heart when we're having trouble forgiving. The next time we get angry at someone or hold a grudge against someone, think of God's words to Jonah. What right have you to be angry? We've been forgiven. We can do that to others as well. We can let God forgive them we can extend that same hand of forgiveness. But Jonah, no, he won't forgive. Jonah goes up the hill outside Nineveh, gets out his popcorn, sits under a tree to watch the fireworks. He's sure that somehow God is still going to destroy Nineveh. It doesn't happen. God lets a plant grow to shade him. Oh, Jonah likes that, but then the plant dies. and Jonah's angry at God all over again and says, take my life, dramatically. And God says, you care about a plant 
I care about the 120,000 people in Nineveh. Yet another reminder, God cares about everyone. Even the people we don't care about, even our enemies. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's how the story of Jonah ends. All right. The question for us is, what enemies do we need to pray for? And who do we need to forgive? Well, Assyria, since God did not destroy Nineveh, the Assyrian army came in and wiped out Israel. God allowed it to happen because of their idolatry. The northern kingdoms conquered, and the Assyrians remove a lot of the Israelites from the land, and they replace them with five other pagan peoples from different places, like the Babylonians, and they bring in their five local gods. Um, the, the main religion of Israel is still, you know, worship of Yahweh, but they also worship these idols. From now on, they are the Samaritans. That's where the Samaritans come from. The Israelites get taken away and mixed with five other peoples and brought back in. Uh, the Samaritan religion is a, syncre is a, a syncretistic religion. Um, and by the time of Jesus, they no longer worshipped idols but they were a, a, a variant form of Judaism. They didn't believe in the whole of the Jewish Bible. They only followed the five books of Moses. They didn't believe in worshiping God at the temple in Jerusalem. They had their own temple on the high place at Mount Gerizim, overlooking Shechem. So the Jews in Jesus' time despised them as corrupted Jews. Here they are today. They still worship God on Mount Gerizim, they only intermarry within themselves, and there's, they're, here they are waving their Torah scrolls. There's only 800 of them left. Wow. They've been uh, a very tiny population for a very long time now. Incidentally, when Jesus says to the Samaritan woman at the well, he, he says to her, you know, go and get your husband. And she says, I have no husband. And he says, you're right. You've had five husbands. The man you're living with now isn't your husband. It's not only, it not only describes this woman's real life, but he's calling out Samaria. He said, hey, you've had five husbands. You've gone after these five pagan gods. And now you're, you're, you're living with the one true God. You're living in sin, but he's not your husband. Mm -hmm. He's calling out, this, this is where you are spiritually, Samaritans. But then what? He, he's not content to leave them there, right? He ministers to them. He comes to them. He says, I'm your Messiah too. All right. So now, northern kingdom's taken out. We have Samaria up there now. Now we turn to the southern kingdom in five minutes or less. It's probably going to take about ten minutes here. We come to the prophet Isaiah. We think of prophets as wild-eyed, zealous people who, you know, like Elijah, who wear animal skins, live in the desert, they fast, they pray. Isaiah's not like that. God, God calls all types of people. Here's Isaiah as shown on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. He's a priest living in Jerusalem. He serves in the temple and at the royal court. He is well-educated, eloquent, respected by everyone. He's married to a, a wonderful woman, a holy woman that he calls the prophetess. Apparently she listens to God too. And he wrote the greatest prophetic book. He gives us the greatest Old Testament prophecies of the Messiah. We hear them all at Christmas. A virgin shall conceive and bear a son. And later, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. We get so used to hearing that, but think about it. Isaiah just said, a child will be born and he'll be God. How outrageous must that have sounded to his original Jewish hearers. God called in one of the best dramatic calls of all scripture, up there with uh, Samuel and Jeremiah. So Isaiah is a young man. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, 
Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. The whole earth is filled with his glory. Sound familiar? Mm -hmm. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people with unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphim to me, having in his hand a burning coal which he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin forgiven. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, Here I am, Lord, send me. We hear echoes of that all over the liturgy, right? I love this scene. I love Isaiah's wonder and awe in worship. I love his enthusiasm to be used by God. I love his recognition that he needs God's help. He needs to be purified by God before he can go forth and do what God's called him to do. Now, later on in the time of Isaiah, the kingdom of Judah finally gets a good king, King Hezekiah. The Bible said he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord like his father David. High praise indeed. Hezekiah removed the pie places, smashed the idols, he even smashed a precious relic the bronze serpent on the pole used by Moses to heal the people because people were worshiping it as a snake god. And he went, enough of this. But then along came Assyria. After King Sennacherib of Assyria conquered the northern kingdom, he sent his army to Jerusalem. The Assyrian envoy shouted at the city. Hi, I'm having trouble with the connection. Oh. Please try again in a moment. No, Assyrian, not Siri. <laughs> the Assyrian envoy gives this incredibly demoralizing speech to the people of Jerusalem. Oh, there they are. There's the Assyrians laying siege to Jerusalem. The church fathers considered Sennacherib to be a type of the devil. This speech is so evil, subtle, tempting. It sounds just like how the devil speaks to us. I'll give a few examples here. Sennacherib calls out to, uh, to Jerusalem, why are you so confident? If you say, we rely on the Lord our God, hasn't Hezekiah removed his high places and altar? Why should he be with you anymore? Well, no, no, Hezekiah removed the, the, the altar of the idols, but he, now the people are confused. Sennacherib then promises them gifts. I'll give you 2,000 horses if you just let me in. He tempts them. Then he lies and says, God is on his side. The Lord said to me, go up against this land and destroy it. I'm just doing what God told me to do. Again, total lies. Mm -hmm. At this point, one of Hezekiah's officials says, uh, excuse me, could you stop shouting in Hebrew? I don't think everyone needs to be hearing this. <laughs> And, of course, the Assyrian envoy keeps shouting in Hebrew. And he says, what? You don't want your soldiers to hear this? That You don't want them to hear that soon they're going to be doomed to eat their own dung and drink their own urine? Mm -hmm. Sennacherib wanted to strike fear and confusion into their hearts. The devil tries to strike fear and confusion into our hearts. Let's see. We're out of time, so I'm going to skip to the end. Hezekiah does exactly the right thing. He orders the people, do not answer him. When the devil tempts us, we do our best to ignore him. Don't listen to him. Don't answer him. Think of how much trouble Eve would have saved the human race if she had just ignored the serpent. Next, Hezekiah took refuge in God. He called for Isaiah and asked for guidance. And Isaiah told him, the king of Assyria may have this overwhelming force, but he's not coming into Jerusalem. God will defend us. And that night, the angel of the Lord went forth and slew the entire camp of the Assyrians. When the men got up in the morning and looked and all around them were dead bodies. Was this, was this supernatural? Was this a sudden disease that absolutely happens in wartime? We don't know. But God saved them because the Assyrians went, oh, we're out of here. And they left as fast as they could. The message for us is resist the devil and he will flee from you.
take refuge in God. Even when things seem hopeless, God is with us. After this, Hezekiah became seriously ill. Isaiah told him he would not recover. He began to walk away, but Hezekiah wept and prayed to God, God, give me more time, more time to turn the people back to you. Before Isaiah even reaches the end of the courtyard, he turns back around and says, God just gave you 15 more years. And as a sign, the shadow on the sundial is going to turn back. And sure enough, the shadow on the sundial went backwards. And Hezekiah lived another 15 years. God really hears our prayers. We're called to pray boldly. He wants our prayers to make a difference. Finally, we're going to talk about two last kings, King Manasseh and King Josiah. King Manasseh ruled 55 years. He's the longest ruling king, and he's the most evil king of Judah. Under his rule, God's law is forgotten. And the prophet Isaiah, tradition has it, was sawn into two. After 55 years, the, the worship of God is gone from the land of Judah. Then you get King Josiah. As a young man, his priests are cleaning out the temple and they say, hey, hey, we, we found this old book with a funny name. Deuteronomy. Does that ring a bell to you? <laughs> Josiah says, oh, is that the lost book of the law? We're like, we think so. Josiah says, well, read it. I want to hear what it says. They read it out loud. Josiah says, oh, we are in so much trouble. We haven't been doing any of this. What, Sabbath? Kosher? Worship one God alone? Oh, boy, are we in trouble. <laughs> so, Josiah becomes the other faithful king besides Hezekiah. He gets rid of all the idols, breaks down all the pagan altars and all the high places. He breaks down the pagan temple Solomon built on the Mount of Olives. He finally gets rid of that golden calf temple in Bethel. It's gone. But after the time of Josiah, the people go back to their idol-worshipping ways. They are stuck. Their time is up. And God says... I need to do something drastic to bring you for your, for, to your senses. It's time to remove you from the land. Next class is exile. Okay. Oh, thank you so much. Oh, Any thoughts or questions? All right, next time we're going to get Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, and Esther is the plan. We'll talk about the exile. Let's close in prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, God, for the example of your prophets. Help us to pray boldly, stay faithful, and step out in faith, and do the things you call us to do. Help us to listen to you and follow you in everything we do, Lord. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.